Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. <clears throat> My name is Arlene Sachs. This is Sally Ann Sachs. And we'd like to welcome Ellen, Ruth Ellen Gruber. Welcome. Thank and you. Ellen is going to, uh, Ruth, Ellen. Ruth Ellen is going to talk to us about her new book, National Geogra The National Geographic Jewish Heritage Travel Guide to Eastern Europe. And thank you. And that was just now published recently? It was published, well, we're in 2008 now. It was published last year. But it's, it's the fourth iteration of this book, or two and a half? What, you, wrote, you wrote a book with that title back in the early right. 90s. I wrote the first edition of the book came out in 1992, and that title was Jewish Heritage Travel, A Guide to Eastern and Central Europe, or perhaps Central and Eastern Europe, I can't remember. Then there was a sort of basic update in 1994 when it became Jewish Heritage Travel, A Guide to East Central Europe. And then there was a reprint with um, some, some, like an extra chapter full of upda updated material in 1999. But this book now, uh, the National Geographic book, is the first really full-scale, detailed update of as many sites as I could. Okay. And what is the book? Tell us, it, we should really start with, tell us what this oh. is. The book is what it says it is. It's a, it's a Jewish heritage guide to, we say Eastern Europe, but I would say actually East Central Europe. It's um, the original concept of the book was former communist Europe that was not the former Soviet Union. Okay. And um, it's the first book that really takes people or took people out of the big cities and into the small towns, villages, old shtetls, all of this. And by now, it's 14 countries because when I started, there were many fewer countries because it was Czechoslovakia, there was Yugoslavia. These have all broken up, and in this edition for National Geographic, I've added two new countries, Lithuania and Ukraine. Oh, but not Belarus. <laughs> you jump frogged. Yeah, I did, and for various reasons. People have asked me, why not Belarus? And one of the reasons is simply I had so much material that I had to draw the line somewhere. And I drew the line at countries where it was not easy to travel to. Yes. And now with Ukraine, you don't need a visa as an American, or at least in 2006, you didn't need a visa as an American. And in all the countries that are in this book, as an American, you would not le need a visa to travel to. Wow. So it makes in, it fairly easy for people that do want to go there. How did you decide on which shtetls, or how did you find them? Well, the way, the way I found the original uh, places dates back to the first edition in 1992. When I started um, researching this book, almost nothing was known about what was there. There was an idea that everything Jewish no longer existed. Fortunately, individuals in several countries during communism had taken upon themselves the mission to document and research Jewish heritage sites. Most of these people were not Jewish. And when I started doing my research, I contacted them. Their names will be known to people who trace their roots now, Monika and Stasia Krajewski and Jan Jagielski in Poland, Arno Pajik and Jiji Fiedler in Czech Republic, now Czech Republic, then Czechoslovakia. Uh, there was an, an old gentleman, an older gentleman in, um, in Slovakia whom I met. In Hungary, Peter Wirt was one. And these people became my guides, and they literally told me where to go. And I went and sat down with maps and their own resources. And I was very happy to be able to put them in contact with each other because they had all been working individually in isolation. So the core material in those countries came from them, from my own research, from history. I knew there were places that I had to go to. And Name it, one of them, would you? Can you off the top I, of your head? What was the place you had to go to? Well, I had to go to cities like Krakow. I had to go to Tarnów. I had to go to, to places that figured in, in Jewish legend or lore or, 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 uh, or tales, something like that. Um, I knew that I had in Czech Republic, I had to go to, to Holoshov because there's a Jewish museum and a synagogue there. I knew that I, besides Prague, I had to go to, you know, Terezin. But... Beyond these places, I, I was, you know, people, people told what me where to go. What do you tell us about each of these places? Synagogues or cemeteries? It, it, or it depends. It depends. And I have to make clear at the outset that I've only, 
In this book, there are hundreds of Jewish heritage sites, but I've only skimmed the surface. Um, there are in, if I have my figures right, there are you know, perhaps 700 Jewish cemeteries in Slovakia, 800 in Romania, hundreds of synagogue buildings still standing one way or another in these countries. I've only managed to, to, to include 30, 40, maybe 50 sites in, in, in the various countries. So it's really skimming the surface. And my intention has been to, you know, show what's there, a representative sample of what's there, including some of the f more famous, but mainly non-famous so sites. So there's cemeteries and there's synagogues. What beyond, uh, anything beyond yeah, oh, that? Certainly, cemeteries, okay. synagogues, former Jewish quarters, um, medieval ghettos, uh, Jewish streets, as it were, in, uh, central, in, in Central Europe? Oh, the, yeah, definitely. In yeah. the bigger cities or in...? At main, well, in the bigger cities, for example, Krakow has the yes, old so Kazimierz. Famous. The famous Kazimierz is the most important and extensive surviving Jewish quarter. And it has the, the, the most intact infrastructure. Uh, but in Czech Republic, there, Trebić has a big Jewish quarter still existing with uh, two synagogues and wonderful Jewish cemetery the streets, the buildings. Uh, Boskovice, not also near in, in, in Moravia, has a wonderful uh, Jewish ghetto. Polna has a Jewish ghetto. Many what? places. Would you find, for example, a mikveh in these places? Oh, yeah, definitely. In, and they keep finding them. I was in Trebić not long ago, in late November, early December. And it's a, it's a lovely, lovely town. And the Jewish quarter as well as the rest of the central town, are now on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites. And um, there I, we visited a, an office of a man, he does architectural plans, and they recently discovered a mikveh in the basement of that building. I sh we should explain the mikveh is a ritual bath. For and and, sure. the, and, the, and the, the, as I understand it, the dimensions are the same everywhere. Because I once got a, that I don't know. I once got a letter from an archaeology professor from the University from Virginia, who was taking some group on a field trip to the Caribbean to Saint um, well, Eustatius. Anyhow, <laughs> and he, they wanted to know about the mikveh right. and how could you be sure? And they checked, and apparently there are. It's supposed to be the same everywhere. That, that I have to say, I don't know. <laughs> but they, they, there are in Mikolov in, in Czech Republic. They have found a mikveh or two. In, in, in many other towns, or many, many is a relative term, but in a number of other places they've discovered mikvaot, and, and now some of them are open to the public. Interesting. Well, I would think of that because if it's a Jewish quarter, I think the cemetery is the first Jewish yeah. site, if you will, that mm -hmm. is built, but then the mikvah is supposed to be the, sa the very next one, so I that they all had that. Yes. Yeah, and of yeah. course, in some of these places, there are active Jewish communities now, and there are modern Mikvot being built. Are they these, the, the, the Jewish communities from descendants of the original people, or are there others that have moved in since then? Or There's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a mixture. Um, you know, the majority of Jews were killed yeah, during, sure. during the war, and uh, particularly in the provinces. Um, but in a number of small towns, even small towns in the larger cities, but also in some smaller towns, there are communities that since the fall of communism have revived and revived their activities. And this is another change that you find since Can when I started. Can you name a couple of them? Are they mostly oh. in Poland or are oh, they no, all over? Oh, no, they're all over, all over. I'm thinking now, um, well, in Slovakia, there are eight or ten Jewish communities. In Czech Republic, about ten. What about Hungary? In Hungary, there are Jewish communities, small ones all over. Um, you know, the most Jews in Hungary live in Budapest, where there are about 20 active synagogues. Um, yeah, but outside of Budapest, there are Jewish communities in, well, in Pech, in Seged, um, in, um, there's even a, a, a tiny community in Tokai, which has maybe just a couple Jews, but the one Jewish man I know there has gone back to being Orthodox, and there's a, a prayer hall, the, the old prayer house that had been a Hasidic shtibble, has been refurbished with funds from a former a Jew from uh, Tokai who moved to the United States as a child, and his family has financed the restructuring of this building so that Orthodox people can go pray there. It's in the heart of the part of Hungary where a lot of the great rabbis are buried. Yes. So there's a lot of pilgrimage trips there, but it gives them a base, and there's dining facilities, and 
you know, it's a nice so you little. You said show. you added two, the two new. Yes. Oh, oh so Ukraine Lithuanian, is, it Ukraine. must be very rich in, in sites to find. Ukraine is unbelievably rich in, in sites. Um, in Western Ukraine, where I concentrated, I mean, it was really tragic for me to only be able to include, you know, 25 sites or so. Each one was more fascinating than the next. But in Ukraine is where I found the least interest, uh, let's say, in the mainstream society in preserving Jewish heritage. Do you have any thoughts about what, what contributes to whether there's an interest or not much of an interest? A part of it is timing. Uh, part of it is who was the government, the Soviet government, was rather right. were strong there. There's also Ukrainian nationalism, which, you know, um, really is trying to reestablish a Ukrainian national identity. And in um, Western Ukraine, of course, once was old-fashioned Galicia, wasn't yes. it? So yes. So there is that and history so of whether it's Ukrainian or Ruthenian or what is it? Yes. And um, so you find some of that. And there's also, there's not, the, the tourist infrastructure in Ukraine, it's a very poor country still. The tourist infrastructure in the provinces is not good. I, when you go to Lviv or Lviv, Lemberg, Leopold, you know, whatever well, you want to call it, to, to um, so all the same, <laughs> same, same places, same, same place, place, different names, all meaning lion in some way or another. You know, it it reminds me of the way Krakow was twenty or or or, or twenty five years ago. It was just beginning to be restored, and part of it had to do with the fact that you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and. In, in 1991, and um, Ukraine became an independent right. nation. It was not very developed then, and a lot of things are, are, are having to be developed. There are, for example, near Lviv, there's a um, Zhokva, a, uh, a synagogue, a fortress synagogue, mm. which is supposedly a national monument, which is supposed to be restored to become a Jewish museum. But when I was there, nothing really had happened. What's a fortress synagogue as opposed to just a synagogue? Oh. Fortress synagogues were built in that area of what's now West, uh, Eastern Poland, Western Ukraine, th those, that border area. They were built in the, let's see, 17th century, maybe, maybe late 60s, 17th century, 18th century as often as part of the town defenses. And they look like fortresses, big thick walls, narrow windows, arch windows often up above the, the top is often crenellated. Is, is that what the, was in the, on the Jewish week? The yeah, that was, a, for, that that was a fortress synagogue in Satanov. Oh. And Satanov synagogue was built as part of the town defenses. So it helped defend the town itself against the Tatars or, oh. you know, and, um, it also would have protected the Jewish community uh, in times of trouble. And you can see in the Satanov synagogue, it's, it, it looks, it's very ruined, but it's one of the most intact because above you can see on the, on the roof line the, the loopholes where they could have you know, shot and all of that. And inside, what's, what's remarkable inside the synagogue is um, the fact that the, the ark has remained. It's a beautifully decorated ark and it still remains there. Of course, the niche is empty. But the carving around it is absolutely stunning. And it's, you go in, I, I sort of crawled through this door. I was afraid to go into the sanctuary because I was afraid Something that the roof fall. might fall on my head. But I stood in the doorway and it's, it's really was sort of thrilling and chilling at the same time to see this just there, the lions and the griffins and the Ten Commandments and the crown of the Torah. That makes Beautiful. me want to ask you something. Are you basically a writer or a photographer? Because your book is both, I think, isn't it? Yeah, my, I'm, I'm basically a writer, but I'm, I also you do your own do photography? photography. Yes, yes, I do. So then that leads me to how did you get into all this? Oh, into all of what? <laughs> Jewish heritage <laughs> sites <laughs> and, and researching them and traveling Even around. Researching well, Europe. it's uh, it dates back to the late 1980s. It, it dates even back even further than that. Um, I. I was a mainstream journalist. I worked for United Press International, and I, I was uh, based in six different countries for them. And uh, the last part of my time with them, for five or six years, I was corresponded in what we then called Eastern Europe or Communist Europe. I was based in, in Belgrade, and then Poland, and then, and then Vienna, covering, covering Eastern Europe from there. And when I was working as a journalist there, you know, I covered occasional Jewish things, but 
It was just part of the story. It wasn't anything special to me. Uh, even one of my first um, Jewish things that I wrote about was when I traveled with the then chief rabbi Rosen in Romania. We traveled yes. all around Romania on what they called the Hanukiada. At Hanukkah, he would travel to all the Jewish communities or many Jewish communities around Romania, having a service, you know, meeting with the people. And I, I went on that for six days and uh, visited, I believe, was it 19 Jewish communities in six days, something, a lot of synagogues and all, including the town where my grandparents came from, oh. Radouts in the north, and found my great-grandmother's grave and all of that. And then um, in the late 1980s, I had begun freelancing by that time, and among my freelance uh, clients was not only the Christian Science Monitor, Monitor Radio, but the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, JTA. So I was writing for a lot of people, and um, also at this time, my, my brother, Sam Gruber, who um, I, I think your, your, your viewers may know of, um, he had become the founding director of the Jewish Heritage Council of the World Monuments Fund. 1989 came, and the revolution started. Oh, I, for Sam and I met, that's right. We met up in, um, in Hungary in September 1989. He, was, he had just taken on this job, and one of his jobs was to put together an inventory or, or try to find out what was there, because nobody knew what was there. And we met in Hungary with my sister-in-law, too. And um, I had gone there to cover some things, both for JTA and for the Monitor Radio. And uh, one of the things was the rededication of the great synagogue in Seged in southern Hungary, southern, south, southeastern Hungary, this mm -hmm. wonderful, magnificent synagogue, which is the masterpiece of the architect Lipot Baumhorn. And Sam and my sister-in-law, Judy, and I, after that, traveled around for several days. A, a book on Hungarian synagogues had just come out, and we traveled around. The Dorfmans? No, no, no. This was a Hungarian book oh, okay. um, that came out in 89 in Hungarian. We couldn't read it. We could look at the pictures and find on the map. And for, for three, three or four days, we traveled around, and we, we visited about 12 different towns and saw the synagogues there. And then the revolutions happened a couple, a couple months later, and Sam said, oh, you're covering these revolutions. If you see anything Jewish, take a picture and send it back, because I'm trying to put together this inventory. Nobody knows what's there. So each time I went to the region to, to write, I would look for Jewish sites, and, and I would take pictures and send them back. And then again, the, early in the next year, in May, I guess it was, in 1990, Sam and Judy and I, again, we met in Poland, and we traveled around with the Piechotkas, uh, who had written a great book about Polish wooden synagogues. And we went and saw, I believe, something like 34 synagogues in Poland. And I realized, you know, all my years covering Eastern Europe, I didn't know these places existed. I had no idea that these places existed. And I got very enthusiastic, and I decided that what needed to be done was a guidebook, because anger became a driving force. I was angry that you would take out a guidebook or a book, a cultural book, and you'd read that in this town there's a 19th century cathedral and a 17th century castle, and there would be an 18th century synagogue or Jewish cemetery that nobody even mentioned. And I, like the individuals I mentioned, I wanted to put these things back on the map, both physically and mm -hmm. mentally. Had you had a strong Jewish education and, and, and identity growing up, or is yeah, this? I, yeah, I grew up. I, I grew up as a typical, I would say, conservative oh. Jew. We come. You know, not observant, but I went to Hebrew school. I went to junior congregation. I never had a bus mitzvah. But, you know, I'd go to services on the holidays. So. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not observant. And you've lived in Europe most of your adult yeah. life. Yes, I have. Uh, so you were very close, in a sense, geographically close to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Holocaust, even if it wasn't on your mind particularly. You were in that territory. I was in that territory, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't part of what I was thinking. writing about or, or thinking, thinking about. Did you experience any anti-Semitism in the places you're looking for or as oh, you traveled? Very occasionally, very occasionally, um, very occasionally. 
the one instance that stands out, you know, was, was back in 1990 on that trip that I went with Sam and Judy. And we were with a, a Polish friend of mine. A, he was a man, I guess, in his 50s then, a bus driver from Białystok. And we went to a small, tiny little village called Krynki, which is on the border of Poland and Belarus. And it has some very, very interesting Jewish sites in it. The remains of three synagogues, Jewish cemetery, things like that. And we, we saw them, and we, we wanted to eat something. And the only place at that time to eat was this horrible, greasy spoon, just disgusting <laughs> restaurant. And on the doorstep were these drunks sitting mm -hmm. there. And I was driving a car that had Dutch license plates with an NL on the back mm -hmm. for Netherlands. And um, these drunken people started talking with our, our Polish friend. And he told us, get in the restaurant, get in the restaurant. OK. And he came a few minutes later. I said, what was that all about? And he said, well, these drunks were saying, are they Jews? Are they Jews? Because the Jews were going to torch the car. And he said to them, no, they're not Jews. You can tell by the license plate. It says NL. That means not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they were so drunk and so stupid that they believed him. Oh my. That was the standout case. But I have really experienced very little um, anti-Semitism personally as I've gone around all these places. Very little. I've experienced an awful lot of sympathy and an awful lot of help from, from people that I met in the, in the towns. I must say that I'm now trying to think, you know, you see graffiti all the time. And yes, I mean, there, are, there is anti-Semitism in these countries. Um, there is not state-sponsored anti-Semitism in any of these countries, but there are individuals who, yes, as, as <laughs> even in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but by and large, I have found uh, real sympathy and real help from the people that I meet in the town. And, and you always go with a guide. You're not no. going off. No, no, I usually go by myself. Do you speak a lot of these languages? No. But I, make, I know how to make myself understood. I've, I went with a guide in uh, Lithuania, and sometimes friends of mine come with me in the other countries. And, but not, you know, once or twice, maybe even more than that, someone from the, the Jewish Museum in Prague has come with me to show me certain things. But you can, I can make myself understood. Do you remember mm -hmm. that Ruth Ellen wrote a, an article for Avertaina once? Uh, I think they I were think mostly, more than once. Yeah. More than once, more a than couple once, times, yeah. with, with beautiful pictures yeah. from uh, Hungary. Yeah. And before we run out of time, I want to um, ask you, how many times are you mistaken for Ruth Gruber, the writer who I think is considerably older than you she, are? Yes, she's, she's half your size. She's in her mid-90s. Oh, wow. It's, you know, it's... It's understandable because we, we write about Jewish. She writes about Israel. I don't write anything about. I write about Eastern and Central Europe. And, but it, it's, it's really remarkable sometimes. There, we, we, ex, we, trade, we trade you know, examples of, of this. And you know, she's received a couple checks that were supposed to be for <laughs> me. And there are always things like there'll be an article about me with her picture in it. <laughs> there, was, there was once the New York <clears throat> Jewish Week ran an article about this confusion with both of our pictures. And, and that's why you use Ellen? That's why I use my middle name, really. Did you always use it when no. you first started? <coughs> no. Um, my first byline, which was a long time ago, uh, my first byline, when I, my first job, I guess, in journalism, more or less my first job, was as intern at, at Associated Press in Rome. I was about 23 or 24 years old. And I had a byline story about something about Leonardo da Vinci, I think. I got a letter from someone I had no idea. I mean, I knew her name as a, as a, as a journalist saying, oh, Ruth, it's so great to see you. Because I just signed myself Ruth Gruber. So great to see you're back working in Europe and all of this. And it's then that I found out that there was this, because I had no idea what was, what was happening, why she was writing me. And I then started using my middle initial and then from when I started writing books, I, I used my mm -hmm. full name. Your mother would yeah. have been happy. <laughs> <laughs> she was happy. Oh, she was. Well, my mother was a very happy person. Oh, and yeah. very. And that you wrote about her. And when it, didn't you write an essay or something? I wrote her? an essay about my mother passed away last year at the age of 86. Mm -hmm. And my mother was an, an artist. 
and uh, she, she had never been sick until she got sick at the end. And ha she lived a long, creative, happy life. And she raised creative children. You and your brother both are interested in, in, in things that are more in that yeah. realm. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yes, and I wrote an essay about my mother, which was published in the fall, and is now the first, um, the first chapter in a book of my essays that's just come out in English in Poland. Can it be purchased in the U.S.? It can be purchased online. Um, you have to go through the Polish website, but they say that they will send them. And they're now working, since it's an independent publisher in Poland, they're trying to figure out some way to sell on Amazon here or get a yeah. partner, partner publisher here that can, that can distribute it. That would be better than having to send copies overseas. Yes. I mean, that, that would be, become cost prohibitive. Um, we just, we've just we got less than a minute left. Is there something else that you want to add on this? That um, we didn't think to ask you. Well, I just, um, you know, my book is, is geared to non-Jews as well as Jews because one of the most important things that I want to make clear is these sites are part of European culture. Yes, Jewish, but European culture. And they are as important and in many cases as beautiful and as stunning and as fascinating as anything else you'll ever see in Europe. And they, 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 they merit a detour, a lot of them. And I recommend people going to see them, even if you have nothing to do with Jewish history in Eastern Europe, even if your roots are not there, even if you just want to see something interesting in Europe. Well, thank you very much. It's thank you. very interesting talking to you or listening to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank just, you very much. Just sit there.